On behalf of our lead sponsor, welcome to our 2023 Summer Series on Belonging, an opportunity for us to re-examine what it means to welcome others. As a means of introduction, my name is Alana Walker Carpenter, and I will be your host. Whether you have a little faith, a lot of faith, or no faith at all, you belong here. For those of you who engage on social media, our hashtag is Entricity 2023 Summer Series. That's Entricity 2023 Summer Series. We will begin with a panel discussion and we will follow with a live Q&A, which we hope to integrate throughout the panel discussion. For those of you who would like to ask a question today, you can simply click on the right-hand side of your screen and those questions will come directly to us. It is now my delight to introduce to you our esteemed panel, Christopher Gordon, partner, EY Canada, Christine Tomlinson, co-founder and co-managing partner of Ruben Tomlinson LLP, and Denis Trottier, Chief Mental Health Officer of KPMG in Canada. Welcome friends and let's get started. Chris, this first question is for you. What does it mean to belong? What value is there in belonging? And lastly, how do we measure belonging? Good morning. Good morning, Alana. Um, and good morning, everybody. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here and having this conversation with you. Um, let me let me get to let me get to to, to the question. Um, personally, for me, and also at EY, we de we define belonging as having the confidence to be your authentic self, no matter the situation, uh, knowing your differences and your diversity are accepted, embraced and, and valued. Um, when we think about, you know, what the value of that is, is allowing people to feel a part and uh, that they have equal voice and equal space at the table really does create uh, the ability for an organization uh, to be more effective we believe that the more diverse, uh, the more inclusive an organization, and the more that people feel that they belong, the greater the solutions and our ability to actually solve some of our clients and our own our, our own uh, biggest challenges and problems that we face. And so belonging is critical to the success of our business, and you transfer that into, into, into our, our, our society as well. Um, in terms of how we measure, different organizations sort of do that in different ways, right? It's a very complicated idea. Belonging feels to many people as this sort of fluffy concept, right? And so one of the things that we've done um, at, at EY is really have very direct questions and surveys on the very specific topic of belonging. We have what we call our people poll survey. And in that, we have very clear and defined questions about how people feel uh, a part of the organization. Do they feel that they can be themselves? Do they feel that they belong within the organization? Do their leaders, because that's also the litmus test, right? Are their leaders creating the spaces where they feel included and where they feel valued and where they feel that they have equal voice at the table? And do they see themselves um, staying with the organization and why, right? And and when you start to get that feedback and that information, it really drives you to a very clear understanding of where we are on that continuum. And then we can go at where we think we have uh, deficiencies and areas that we need to really double down on and, and add additional training or couch, uh, coaching um, and supports to our leaders to be to be better in that area of allowing our people to feel to be themselves and bring the, their whole selves to work. I don't know if that's answered the question, but but certainly that's how we go at it at, at EY. But it is sometimes it can feel like a very fluffy topic. But if you get down to the the nuts and bolts of it, you can get really rich data uh, to help you as an organization understand if you've created a, a culture of that. And in the course for myself, I lean in. I have conversations. I you know I I feel that in the in the discussions I have with my teams when there are these friction, these tension points. Are my teams coming and having real conversations with me? Are they challenging me in a room? Do they feel free to be able to have those conversations? Have I removed that partner hierarchy barrier um, um, and created a space where people feel that they can add value? Because uh, I'm not always right. <laughs> I have strong opinions, <laughs> but I'm, I'm certainly not always 
right. And so I allow my teams the space to challenge me um, um, uh, and give them that feeling that they are part of the solution. And um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how I go at it personally, but certainly that broader piece is there. Thanks, Chris. I don't think it's a fluffy topic. In fact, in preparing for this, I was reading an article in the Harvard Business Review, and it was saying belonging is good for business. And, you know, they were like, 100%. About, about, 100%. about reduced sick days. I mean, it really is good for business. I hope that people do it beyond that. It's good for business. You mentioned some really important things for us to consider, right? We're doing this so people feel like they can bring their whole self to work. And I think that that's particularly important with the next generation that we want all to feel welcome at the table. And I love that you've introduced this People Pulse survey. And I can just think about how we can reimagine that for other organizations. Christine, drawing on your respectful workplace training, how can we create a culture of respect? In essence, how can we create a culture of belonging? What responsibility does an employer have versus an employee? So I love that you've kind of prefaced this with talking about how belonging is good for business because it, if I pick up on the question about it being a responsibility, I think that um, organizations that approach it from that perspective often struggle. So we like to think that it's, you know, it's less about sort of a have to do as opposed to what you can do. And we get this question a lot. We get this question from organizations who reach out to us. You know, this is something we want to do. We're privileged to work with organizations that really care about their people and they want, they, re they really want to do this. They want to create this culture where people can feel like they can bring their authentic selves to work. And you mentioned the training. The training is something that we believe really strongly in. There's research out there that talks about the role that training can play in helping to create that environment, but it's a very specific kind of training. Um, it is not compliance training. It is training that is um, interactive. So, you know, we used to say it had to be in person. Now, of course, we can't always do it in person. We couldn't do it in person during the pandemic, but it has to be, it has to be interactive so that people can actually engage with the facilitator. It's got to be tailored to each unique workplace. And it's got to really take people through what are the expectations of behavior in a workplace? What does belonging mean? What can you expect in our workplace where we want you to belong? And how do you identify when that's not happening for you? And then what are the options that you have? And we, you know, it's amazing. It's, we hear this from people who go through the training and they talk to us about how they've never really had something like this before, how, what it says to them about their organization that they have invested in this kind of experience for them and allowed them to take time away from their work to really have these kinds of conversations. And then when issues come up, and we do that work too, we do work uh, addressing issues, investigations and, and into issues of disrespect. And people will say like, I attended the training and I learned that this was something that could be addressed and I learned how to address it. I learned who to talk to. So it's not a panacea. You know, there's a lot of other work to do besides that. And, and Chris touched on this in terms of the role that leaders can play to really then take those issues that come to their attention and address them. Um, but the training is a great start. And I love that you mentioned that it's tailored, right? When we're thinking about the concept of belonging and creating culture and sustaining culture, it really isn't meant to be a cookie cutter approach. We need to look organization by organization, person to person. Denny, mental health falls under inclusion, diversity, and equity. And this has been by design. It does not fall under diversity, equity, and inclusion. Talk to us, Denny, about how that's played into creating a culture of belonging by reversing how you've rolled that out. Yeah, it's it's interesting to, by design, put inclusion first, because really you can have the most diverse workforce and, you know, everything in balance from an equity perspective. But if your team doesn't feel included, right, <laughs> like belonging is a sense of, of fitting in with your family, with your friends, and it's it's so fundamental to overall well-being, right? I, I like the points that Chris and Christine raised about um monitoring and training because really at the end of the day a lot of this it, 
is knowledge, right? If I tie it directly to mental health, when we open our mental health to a, to a box, what knowledge do we have, right? Uh, we all have inherent biases in how we treat people and so on. So the knowledge and making sure that we are moving to dial with our team members so that they are fostering an inclusive workforce. I love that my job description, the first line is Denis will contribute to a culture where people can bring their whole selves to work, including caring for and talking about their mental health. And, it, and it's interesting, Alana, that mental health sits within ID&E. In many organizations, I remember early days, sometimes I get challenged by that a bit, right? And I'd go, well, it doesn't matter. We're part of a very senior council across the country of 24 partners, and we've decided to make mental health a pillar of our ID&E strategy. And by the way, in that population, if I'm afraid to come out or I've been bullied, it, it does by default probably make sense that it sits outside of HR so that it has a different lens on it. Again, you've brought us back to the, the whole self. And I remember when I was sitting with Christopher last year, I was interviewing him for another event. And I, I had that aha moment related to how you've done this by design. And I remember saying, it's not enough to be diverse. It's not enough to be equitable. It's not enough to be inclusive. What matters is that people feel like they belong, right? And I would love to see the word belonging right there with IDA or DEI in the future for organizations. Chris, you lead the global immigration practice for EY Canada. As you consult clients, as you're onboarding these new hires, both externally and internally, how do you ensure that employees feel like they belong, specifically in a hybrid culture? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, if I think about sort of the work that we do and that I do specifically in this space of not just onboarding, you know, new hires, but onboarding new hires from different countries around the, around the world. Uh, culture is super important, right? And uh, these individuals come with their own sort of values and culture, uh, cultural expressions and experiences. And so what's important for our organization and other organizations when bringing those individuals in uh, is is really creating a space where they can feel very quickly connected to the culture of their of their organization um, and, 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 and the broader Canadian societal culture. But the, the, the ability to do that and smooth that over is really uh, is really specific because those people have, uh, again, as I say, they come with their own personal customs and uh, societal customs. So really, it's an integration of uh, really getting them to understand what the organization's culture is. And that's, you know, you, you give them support through, you know, buddy systems and uh, counselors and coaches and, you know, cultural training and cross-cultural training and things like that. But also understanding that they also, uh, in order for them to be, uh, Denny spoke about sort of the mental health aspect, what we don't really think about when we bring in uh, uh, foreign workers into our country is the the huge sort of emotional toll um, that that takes on them, right? When I came to Canada, you'd think I came from the UK, but as a as a black man coming to Canada, my biggest challenge was where am I going to live? Where am I going to put my kids into school where they may not ex where they where I'm hoping they're not going to experience some of the the racism that I experienced in the UK? And so you'd look at me, you'd hear me speak, and you think that I have no real issues. Right. And so really understanding that individual and saying, OK, we now not only from an employment perspective, we need to make sure they feel a part of the, the, the culture of our organization. But, you know, maybe we need to help them with the settlement services, uh, uh, finding locations where they can uh, live, where they're, you know, they're close to stores where they may have their the food that they that they're uh, accustomed to or the communities that they're more accustomed to. So really having these conversations, I think someone spoke about having discussion and conversation is really important to understand what their specific needs are. It takes a little bit more work, right? And some more intentionality around that. But what we've found is that the more that individual, the success of an assignment or the success of, of integrating a foreign national, foreign worker, into your workforce is really driven not only by the culture of the organization but their ability to settle in the in the community 
And so creating those community-based supports or getting them connected with those community-based supports, whether it's a religious group or a, a cultural group, or again, you know, different clubs and organizations that will cater to the piece that the organization, the firm may not be able, the company may not be able to cater to, really helps to settle them more quickly. Um, and in and again, they feel that the company now has taken care of their whole self and not just their work self, right? There's that work persona and there's that holistic persona. And so really thinking a little bit beyond the walls of the, of the organization, I think is going to be super critical to uh, getting those people to sort of land and be more specific. The hybrid piece of it is, again, that I think comes out of the work culture. And so once you understand the work, the, the organizational culture, some organizations are not necessarily as hybrid as we think. Um, some of them are very much in person. So it really depends on the organization's culture um, and what their decisions have been around, whether they're fully hybrid or not. But it fits within that. And, and organizations are working out how to work best there, but creating the right systems and, and connection points and communication points uh, are critical and of critical importance. You know, we've just sponsored a family, like a refugee family, and so many of the things that you just said have played out with us, like where they go, which race, you know, where they can hear people within their, their own language. And I also realized, and I think this is the same for Corporate Canada, onboarding isn't one three-hour event, right? In yeah. essence, we are constantly onboarding an employee for the whole time that they're with us. We are creating that culture of welcome. Christine, as part of your role, you help organizations create belonging statements. And in fact, our own organization right now is in the process of creating a belonging statement. What do you think employers need to consider as they roll this out? So I, I should probably start by acknowledging that a, being at the point of creating a belonging statement is probably kind of the Cadillac in this area. My guess is ENY and KPMG probably have these. Uh, but I think most um, of the organizations we encounter aren't there yet. So if folks joining us today don't have that, I think probably what you have instead are things like, um, you know, could be sort of harassment and discrimination policies, could be respect at work policies. But that's how these kinds of um, statements or policies began was as you know, initially compliant, legally compliant. We have um, for a number of years now had laws in in Ontario and across Canada that require employers to have policies that speak to these kinds of um, behaviors in the workplace. And if, if, if you're still at the compliance stage, then you've probably got a little bit of work to do to move beyond that. Because again, it's not so much what you have to do, it's what you can do. So one of the things that we do uh, is we work with employers to take their, you know, very well drafted legal compliant policies, but look at them from a different lens. So imagine yourself being an employee who is experiencing an issue of disrespect or, or not belonging in the workplace and you want that addressed. So it's wonderful to have a policy someplace that you can look to say, what are the expectations in this organization? Is it, is what I've experienced not meeting those expectations? And then what steps can I take to address that? So that's that's great, but it's interesting when we engage with these policies that often we find that they're not written from that lens. So I'll give you an example. I, I reviewed one recently. And you know, again, if I'm an employee who's experienced disrespect, I'm gonna look at that policy. And the first thing I'm gonna look for is what happened to me. Does this policy cover what happened to me? So I want to be able to see early in the policy that, okay, yes, I'm in the right place. So imagine that I'm an employee who has experienced something really subtle, something like a microaggression, which is a really significant barrier to belonging in a workplace. And I look at this policy called, you know, harassment and discrimination policy. I, is that what I experienced? Is it harassment? I don't know. So early on in that policy, I'm going to want to see something that looks familiar to me. So this policy that we reviewed recently had 15 pages of kind of, you know, policy stuff and uh, process stuff. And the definitions of kind of behavior in the workplace were at the end. 
And, and I couldn't imagine if I was someone who'd experienced some kind of issue in the workplace that I wouldn't get through 15 pages before I would find finally at the end that, oh yes, this is, this is actually what I'm supposed to be looking at. This applies to me. So it's just sort of thinking about that, thinking about making these policies more accessible to employees, um, taking, you know, otherwise very well worded legal compliant policies, but making them accessible to employees, making them things that they can actually use. And then of course, you know, another shout out to training. <laughs> it's one thing to have them. It's another thing to make sure that people know where they are and understand them too. So training play a great role there. Thanks, Christine. So accessible, another, you know, way for us to think about accessibility, accessibility, and just being able to have that policy in front of us to, to be able to readily find that information and to be able to use it and understand it too, that it just doesn't sound like a foreign document. Denny, in the past, you've noted that mental health is not an HR issue. You've been steadfast in saying that it is a corporate issue. And in fact, you've gone one step further and said it's an all of us issue. What do we need to have in our mental health toolkit to create and foster a culture of belonging? You know, the fact that it's 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 an all of us issue, Alana, to me, uh, I teach a lot at Ivy to CEOs and my aha uh -uh moment is seeing the light come on that, oh, I have a role to play here. It's not just HR budgets. It's not a program. You know, a lot of friends of KPMG and, and clients that I, I have the honor to speak with. Sometimes I'm asked, well, Denny, what did you buy on the mental health front? <laughs> I, I keep a white box of software and I go, I just bought this, I plugged it in and it's all good. It's not like that, right? What we need to put in our own mental health toolbox, and it's interesting because we as an employee have a role to play as well, right? The employer needs to make sure that all the tools are ready, available, and that they're appropriate you know, organizations that are fortunate enough to have an employee assistance program. Why is it that you get a white male all the time as a counselor? Why can I not have an Asian female or a black counselor, somebody that I'm more comfortable with, right? So on the on the employer side, I think we got to make sure that the tools are culturally appropriate and are as such that our teams feel that they can rep, get the right support that they need. On our side, the employees is, investing in these tools, right? It's up to us to open that mental health toolbox and say, what do I have in here to care for myself? And are some of these tools outdated? Little simple things um, like mental health first aid, as an example, have you ever taken that? Why, why not? If a child came home and said, hey, mommy, I think the world would be better off without me. How do you react? Do you know what to say? Do you know the language, right? So I think we're all at a different place because mental health is a continuum. So I think all of us have to stop and look at what's, what's in our knowledge toolbox, right? The organizations, the ones our listeners who are fortunate enough to be working for larger organizations have access to many tools. Are you investing in them? If you don't have access to those tools, are you perhaps Googling in your local community, you know, mental health services in Ottawa? And here in Ottawa, you hit uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association, you hit the Royal Ottawa. There's a lot of free tools that are out there that you can put in your toolbox. We have a role to play in this space as well. The employer could put it all there, but Denise cannot grab Alana's finger and push the mental health or KPMG button on her desk. Stop. So we need to invest in ourselves as well. Vinny, I'm going to do a follow-up question for you. So rules to, back to the, you know, mummy, I think the world would be a better place without me. World Suicide Day is September the 10th. And as you know, I've been journeying with a family that just lost their son who died by suicide. And last Friday, I woke up for a colleague whose son had died by suicide as well. And so, Dene, I am wondering, the theme for this year is creating hope through action. So how can we create hope through action? I just feel like suicide with young people is just at an all-time high right now. It's education, Lana. That's why I was so excited to be part of this forum this morning, right? 
And we got to remember our role. I mean, in my role, I, I, I have helped colleagues, you know, it's not because KPMG are professionals that all these issues that all of us face are not there, right? And sometimes when people lose a colleague, it's the could have, should have, what did I miss, right? So I think it is so important that we educate ourselves so we have that knowledge, right? Imagine being able to ask your elderly dad or your daughter, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Are you getting dark thoughts, right? And through training, you get that. You know, the Cadillac in the mental health space, Alana, is the 12-hour mental health first aid training. It actually trains you on an acronym as to how to talk to somebody who's at risk of self-harm. So it's, it's critical that we have that knowledge to be able, we'll never prevent, unfortunately, right? The realization is that it's an illness, it's a mental, it's, it's a condition, right? No different than, than physical health, but I think it's upon us to do everything possible so that we could prevent. And, and remembering our role in Atlanta is so critical, critical. And I love Movember, the acronym ALEC. The A is ask, how are you, Alana? And you'll probably say, I'm fine. That's proven. 71% of the people say that. The L in Alec, that's my role, to listen to you non-judgmentally. I'm not here to fix it. I'm not a mental health doctor. The E is to encourage you to access resources. Hence why it's so important to know what these resources are internally and externally. And the C in Alec is easy. Alana, thanks for opening up to me. I know you're going through a rough time. Why don't we grab a coffee tomorrow? So little things like that of moving our knowledge dial so that we're comfortable talking about it and we open that dialogue, right? We're stuck in the mental health, let's talk. You know, the bell, let's talk. I love the new subtitle, every action counts, right? It's up to us to take action. Nobody else can do that for us. Or we're going to be 10 years out, we're still going to be talking about IV and E, mental health, belonging, but we need to take action. <laughs> Love that. And you and I have talked on the side. It's got to be more than a day. It's got to be more than, than a week. I'm glad you brought us back to mental health first aid training because I want you to know I'm guilty. When our son was born, we went through like the infant CPR. We invested a lot, but we have not as a couple invested in mental health first aid for this next season of our life. And it's something that I'm going to commit to do today. So thank you. Chris, why should belonging be important to men and women of faith in corporate Canada? Yeah, I, well, I, I think it should, you know, I think belonging should be important to men and women of faith, regardless of whether they're in corporate Canada or not. But specifically, I think it's important for those of us that are people of faith to 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 understand that the gospel that we espouse or we 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 subscribe to is one that is underpinned uh, by whosoever will should and can come right and so there are there are there are no there are not these restrictions to somebody coming to be a part of the fellowship or the family and i think it's important that we recognize that and that we are the expression of that message within society and within our communities and the communities with, within which we operate. So whether that's corporate Canada, whether that's you know in, in your communities or, or whatever. And so as, as people of faith, sometimes we can be very focused on the, uh, the thou shalt not, right? And the things that sort of exclude or, or cause sort of, uh, and we, we tend to judge around that and then determine who should be part of the club and who shouldn't be. That's not really our role. Our role is to is to present uh, salt or light, right? And I've always said it in this way. Um, if you're only, if salt is only on a plate of salt, then it loses its whole purpose and essence. Or if light is only in a room of light, then it, 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 it isn't effective. And so it's important that we recognize that we are there to, to shine a light or to bring flavor and to, and to bring a, a relational connection um, um, where, wherever we operate, wherever we are uh, called to be, whether that's in corporate Canada or elsewhere. And that's the, that's the essence of the gospel that we, that we espouse, that, you know, 
whoever, whosoever will can come, right? And I think that we have to allow uh, people to experience who we are. You know, the, I think, you know, I'm a Christian. So, you know, the Bible says, this is let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and that they may then have access to, to a relationship or glorify the father. And so, and so for me, it's less about you can come or you can't or whatever, but actually it's about uh, the expression of joy to the world, right? It's a universal, uh, universal message in the sense that everybody is included. We are, I believe that, and we are all God's family. Um, and so God calls us and bids us all to come to him wherever you are, right? So that's, that's kind of, uh, how I how I really look at our role as 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 believers or you know in corporate Canada. And I love the analogy of salt and light. And mm -hmm. bottom line, all are welcome. Right? Yeah, all are welcome. Christine, I'm going to hop ahead here. I'm just going to pick up on this brief conversation about the church. For the most part, churches have had a really wonderful place in in our world, in our country, in our cities. Um, they have done extraordinary things. However, over the last few years, there have been some leaders of churches and parachurches that have fallen from grace. So my question for you is, how can churches or places of worship, wanting to be a little bit more inclusive here, create a safe space for all to belong amongst these moral failures? Well, I'm going to make it even more inclusive to say that churches share... Uh, a uniqueness with, I think, a number of other types of organizations where you've got individuals within the community who are um, particularly vulnerable to misconduct on part of people who are in positions of power. So for sure, we've seen examples within sort of the faith communities. We've seen very <laughs> well publicized examples within sports uh, we've seen, we had an example here in Toronto recently where a bunch of young people came forward regarding a music teacher, so in education settings. Um, so I think if you are an organization, uh, faith-based or otherwise, that knows that you have that particular makeup, that you've got persons within your community who are particularly vulnerable to misconduct or bad behavior, then there are absolutely steps you can take. And I think you proactively really need to take those steps to ensure that people are feeling um, that are not subjected to that behavior and are feeling included and respected. So one of the first things uh, to note is we know from the research in this area that in any organization, the percentage of people that will actually complain, report inappropriate workplace or organizational behavior is about 25%. So it's a very low percentage. There's all kinds of barriers and like legitimate good, um, you know, good authentic reasons why people are reluctant. But one of the things that we also know is that the power of bystanders to come forward is really significant. So there are types of training that organizations can do that can, first of all, training in general will help for the reasons I talked about earlier. But bystander training can be another tool in the toolkit to help enhance the likelihood that if people become aware that these issues are taking place, that they can come forward on a victim's behalf. And you hear this, I mean, you hear this repeatedly in these situations when they finally come out that there were all kinds of people who knew that this was going on. They weren't experiencing it, but they knew about it and they didn't know what to do. They didn't know they could do anything. So training can help address that. So that's a big piece. Um, and then another piece that I would identify is, again, if you're an organization that knows that you've got this uniquely vulnerable population, you can be proactive. Instead mm -hmm. of just waiting for someone to come forward and report a problem, you can ask you can ask, you know, you heard Chris talk about sort of the people pulse surveys, different types of surveys, different types of means that you can use to um, communicate with and seek input from members of your community and, and members of your population to try and find out what their experience is within the organization. So that can be a people pulse type survey, it can be an employee engagement survey, but it can be all types of other ways to 
capture that information if you're in a different type of organization. And sometimes just asking the right questions can eke out that kind of behavior when it's happening. Again, not always from the victims necessarily, sometimes from bystanders, but um, we do a lot of that work for organizations and it's rare when an organization suspects that something is going on that we don't find some hint of it when we seek that kind of input. So Christine, we should not be waiting for complaints. That's, you know, we need to be proactive as organizations. You've brought us back to training, but you also brought us back for us to be asking the right questions. We can be asking questions, but they're not necessarily the right questions. Denny, one of the ways in which KPMG in Canada has fostered belonging is through its 35 people network groups. You've got faith-based groups, you've got groups for Indigenous friends, our Black friends, you've got women's groups, you've got a lot of groups. These groups just don't foster a culture of belonging. They also inform the organization. So my question for you is what impact have these people networks have on the culture of belonging at KPMG? How have they informed the organization? They, they are the voice and ears, Alana. Um, I could not do this humbling role of chief mental health officer without all these groups. You know, the Coles note scenario behind these groups is they create safe spaces where people of similar background, people of similar experiences can come together and learn and grow and exchange ideas. I have learned so much by participating in as many as these groups as I can. And it's not all technical knowledge, soft skills. Sometimes it's cooking a, a meal that's, that's you know, culturally appropriate and you learn new things or dances and so on. But it, it, it's, they become the voice and ears to your overall well-being strategy because at the end of the day, it, 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 it's their strategy, right? If I step back a number of years, oh, it's mental health week, better better do something, you know, or it's Bell Let's Talk and it just sits on a shelf somewhere because nobody owns it. Now there's no accountability. But when you have all these networks, now I fast forward one e-com from Denis on the day perhaps of mental health week, and then all these people network are hosting events bringing in speakers that are more culturally appropriate than Denny the white male, right? So it, 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 it's, it's, it's amazing because it, it's an eye-opener too, Alana, that I realized when I stepped into this role that we have upwards to around one-third of our people who are home alone. They might be living in a condo in Toronto or in Vancouver. They're new to Canada, perhaps, or have moved or whatever. So, you know, the, these networks... It, from the belonging angle, it's interesting when I travel and there's one of these network meetings I always attend and it, it, it's so interesting and so welcoming because it's kind of neutral, right? Like many people, maybe it's the first time that they attend to discover and learn, but the strategy falls out of their input. As an example, the fact that our employee family assistance program, when you called for counseling, you would get whoever's on call. Why, right? You wouldn't you would pick Christine, Chris, or I overnight as a professional advisor. You'd get to know us, but yet on something so personal, <laughs> you're just going to get whoever's on call. Why, why can I not look at the bio of these counselors and, and be more comfortable, right? So little things like that, Elena, come out of these people group. They tell you what's not working. <laughs> So good, so good. And I know that I might not have these people networks accessible to me personally, but I'm leaning into individuals rather than networks and some networks, but I'm leaning into individuals. So we can at very least, if you're in a more small boutique organization, lean into others. And this is a great transition question for you, Chris. You head up the EY um, for EY Canada the Entrepreneur uh, of the Year. And this question comes from our guest and it says, what does belonging look like for a single entrepreneur? And I don't think they're meaning single in their marital status as much as that solo entrepreneur. We've talked a lot this morning about creating culture of belonging for organizations, but what about an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur that's on their own? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And one of the things in doing that amazing, you know, just 
sitting in this space around entrepreneurship and meeting some of these amazing entrepreneurs is one is that very sort of singular focus that drives them to do great things and be super innovative. Um, what I've learned in, in the work that I've been doing um, is there are communities of entrepreneurs. And, and so whilst that individual may be very much alone in their business, right, they're not alone in the community of entrepreneurship. And so there are different entrepreneurial organizations that they can, you know, find one that fits with, you know, either it's their industry or uh, a, a cultural expression or whatever, but there are so many groups of entrepreneurs, uh, uh, programs, accelerator uh, or, uh, groups, different entrepreneurial communities that they can become a part of. And as you mentioned, leaning into community or leaning into sort of uh, mentorship and individuals, and they can find that space of belonging there. Um, I think it's really important because one of the things I've learned in that work with entrepreneurship is once you create this ecosystem, uh, it actually helps to accelerate the growth of your organization, right? Because you make connections or you learn from others uh, a different way maybe of thinking about it or doing or going at the issues or the challenges that you're facing as an entrepreneur. Uh, alone, uh, what, what did I say? Go alone, you will go faster, uh, but go together, you'll go further, right? And so I think it's really important as, as entrepreneurs, a single or solo entrepreneur, that you find those communities of, uh, like-minded entrepreneurs um, and, and business owners um, to really help you accelerate the growth of your business, but also create an environment where you can find that support and you can lean on people in tough times and lean into, into those uh, deeper conversations because being an entrepreneur is, is tough, rewarding, but it can be a tough space and it can be a tough space to go at it alone. We go together. We go together. We go together. Um, this last question will be for Christine. I want our guests today to know that I've seen the other questions that have come in and we will get you the answers that you desire. Specifically, I know people are looking for mental health supports where we can go and also access to belonging statements. We will get that information to you. Christine, this next and final question is for you. The Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin, the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada said this, we need human rights whether we like it or not, religious, ethnic, and cultural diversity is part of our modern world and increasingly part of our national and community reality. Human rights and the respect for every individual upon which they rest offer the best hope for reconciling the conflicts this diversity is bound to generate. If we are to live together in peace and harmony within our nations and as, as nations in the wider world, we must find ways to accommodate each other. So my question for you, and I think this is a great place for us to end our conversation today, is how do we restore workplace harmony in our efforts to create a space of belonging? I love that quote, because uh, it sort of captures everything that uh, I think a workplace needs to, to thrive with the people that are there. and. Um, and, and as an organization that is a microcosm of our country of Canada. So we talked about this. We talked about how belonging is good for business, and it's because it isn't enough to bring together a diverse group of people to, and expect that great things will happen. Uh, they really have to be able to bring their best different selves to that work. And um, when they do and are able to do that, which they are in a culture of belonging, organizations have just boundless opportunity. So how do we get there? Um, we, I love that Denis talked about his work with CEOs because I think that there's so much that starts at the top um, and that buy-in, you know, there are times that we get retained kind of by the HR department and we might do some training and, you know, the CEO might not even attend. And I think that says a lot to an organization about the importance of the training. So I contrast that to times where the CEO says, this is so important to our organization that I'm going to introduce every one of these sessions. And I'm going to tell all of you when we do this work, why it matters to us, why this is so important to us. So I think that's a big part of it. I think um, then we've talked about kind of training employees generally, but training leaders to really understand their role 
in identifying when behavior in a workplace falls below the acceptable standard, because sometimes it's not always obvious, and the very significant role that they have to play in addressing it. Like all the good work you can do in an organization doesn't mean anything if when something happens, if somebody experiences disrespect or lack of belonging and a leader becomes aware of it and they don't address it. It's like, you're not walking the walk. So like, I can't trust that I'll, if I bring something forward here, it's actually gonna make any difference. So it's all part of that system. And even the system where it uh, encourages people to come forward and it seeks to address problems when they come up still has to try to put that back together again when they realize what the problem actually is. So there's, uh, you know, a further role for something that we call workplace restoration, which is really, you know, a form of conflict resolution. But you have to first understand what the conflict is. That's uh, a lot of the investigation and assessment review type work we do. Um, but then how do we get these people to come together again and repair the relationships so that they can move forward in a productive way. So there's a lot of different pieces to it, uh, but we've worked with, we've been so lucky to work with organizations that are really committed to putting all those pieces in place. And when they do, like the opportunities are just endless. So workplace restoration and redemption. And one of the key things that I, I'm so glad you brought up again is it starts from the top. So there are many leaders on this call this morning it starts with you. You are the top. It's hard to believe that our conversation has come to an end. I think we could have sat here for another 45 minutes and continue to answer your questions and dialogue with each other. Again, we will commit to getting answers to all of your questions. I want to thank all of those who have served behind the scenes. A Derek from Studio B, Mike from Think Radiant, um, Devin, and Zishan and Adam from Life Meeting and Jane and Anna from Intricity. And of course, our esteemed panelists, Christopher, Christine, and Denis for just their very thoughtful and honest insights on helping us shape a culture of belonging. All of our summer series will be featured on our YouTube channel. So we invite you to subscribe and to share. Our two final sessions will be on August 9th and August the 23rd. The August 9th session on technology will feature Barry Doucette, CEO of Orange Tech, Scott Delaney, CEO of Luminex, and Scott Patterson, Executive Chairman of Future Vault. In closing, we are all responsible in how we lead. We can choose belonging. We can choose to cultivate a culture and sustain a culture with belonging at the forefront. To me, the most powerful example of belonging is found in Jesus. He personified what it means to welcome others and to love others. And this is the essence of intricity. Will you join us on our journey? Thank you for attending the 2023 Summer Series on Belonging. <laughs>